Chapter 4 Emily 911 Emily loved her job and the people she worked with. She was currently assigned to the Fort Pierce Police Department radio, also known as Port Fierce Radio. Her current assignment was the midnight shift at the St. Lucie County E911 Public Safety Center. She'd worked the police radio for almost two years now, and she loved it, or had up until about two weeks ago. She loathed the last hour of her shift. Michael, her ex-husband, was a police detective with the FPPD and normally worked an 8-to-5 shift Monday through Friday. So Emily had very little contact with him besides the rare late-night call-out for major crimes. She made sure she was always professional on the radio, even though when she heard his voice come across the radio, she wanted to scream. But after the divorce, Michael had requested a reassignment to road patrol, and the request was approved. So for the last two weeks, Michael had been coming on duty for the road patrol just before her shift ended. He'd caught her off guard that first morning he came across the radio. Emily felt her heart jump up into her throat, and she was barely able to reply. She really hated to leave her position. Emily was a good radio dispatcher, and the police road patrol supervisors trusted her, but hearing his voice every morning was just too much. Emily had pulled her supervisor aside earlier in the shift last night and talked to her about maybe moving back to call taking or even to another radio. I just can't deal with it anymore, Emily confided. I would be happier if I never had to speak to him again. I understand, I really do. Sherry, her supervisor, assured her. It's time for someone else to start training on Fort Pierce Radio, so don't worry about it. Emily was sad but relieved. She loved the radio but loathed her ex-husband. She was hoping she could move to another radio, but she knew that was unlikely. Radios were coveted, and although radio dispatchers were moved around as needed, everyone had their preferred radios. Fort Pierce Radio was Emily's favorite position, and answering the 911 emergency lines was her least preferred position, but most likely that was where she was headed. But if answering phones kept her from hearing Michael's voice almost every morning, then it was worth it. Emily was finishing up her ninth year as a public safety telecommunications officer with St. Lucie County Public Safety. Emily and her co-workers consider themselves the first first responders. They are certified, licensed, and fingerprinted by the state of Florida, but their legal designation categorized them as clerks and secretaries. Not that there is anything wrong with clerks and secretaries, but as a public safety telecommunicator, they were held to a much higher standard. They can work up to 16 hours a day, night and day shift, all holidays, and mandatory overtime. And then there is the exception of states of emergency, like hurricanes. During state of emergencies, public safety dispatchers are considered emergency personnel and can be held in their positions for days. It's rare, but it happens, especially if it is your area that's hit and the extent of the damage. You basically stay at your center until you are relieved. Stress and anxiety are also a huge part of the job. Public safety telecommunicators are responsible for people's lives. It's a telecommunicator's responsibility to gather critical information for responders and getting help to people in crisis 24-7, 365 days of the year. There are only two dispatchers at the Fort Pierce pod, Emily and her 1012. This is her records channel operator, Heather. The beginning of the overnight shift was always busy. It was often pure chaos, officers arriving on scene of calls, going on traffic stops, coming on duty, going off duty, more calls coming in that needed dispatching, calls like accidents, domestics, and fights, sergeants wanting to know where all their officers are and why calls are pending. You could sit down at 7 o'clock in the evening, and the next time you look up, it's midnight. That's how busy a radio can get sometimes. Once the bars closed, though, the radio would become almost silent, and trying to fill those hours was tough. Thankfully, Emily and Heather got along very well. They had friends in common and children around the same age. They chatted about their children, current affairs in the news, and gossiped a little. If it was really slow, they might pull out some cards and play rummy or grab a puzzle to build. 
Emily usually had a book she was reading, but lately she found reading put her to sleep, and that was a big no-no. You could get fired for sleeping on the job. Like most small workplaces, everyone knew Emily's current situation. They had all heard about Michael's indiscretion. A few knew even more before Emily, which made her feel stupid and humiliated in front of her co-workers. These same co-workers tried to reassure her repeatedly that she should never be embarrassed by anything that happened. It was not her fault. However, some nights, no matter what anyone told her, she still felt foolish and stupid, on top of heartbroken. Tonight, though, everyone stuck to their own pods. It seemed unusually quiet to Emily, but she was okay with that. By the time Emily's relief finally showed up at 6.40 a.m., she was ready to go home and pass out. She was exhausted and had another headache. Emily was tired but feeling fine until Michael had come on duty. Hearing his voice coming through the radio upset her, and she felt the headache start before she was able to unplug from her headset and clock out. It became a raging migraine when she turned the corner of 13th of Boston and saw the police cruiser make the right several blocks up from the house. Emily knew it was him. She knew he had come by the house to check on the children in the morning and in the evenings on days she worked. They both worked 12-hour shifts, but they were staggered. Before the divorce, working days for Michael meant he was home at night with the kids, and Emily working midnights meant she could take the children to school, pick them up, and be home in the afternoons with them. Somehow, it had always worked out, but now she was struggling. She appreciated Michael checking on the children because they were the most important thing in her life, but seeing him and knowing he was there tore out her heart. Emily pulled up into the driveway, parked, and got out of her car. She walked towards the house, but all she could think about was the large bottle of aspirin in the pantry. Randy opened the door for her as she stepped on the porch and smiled at her. She tried to return the smile as she walked into the house, but the smile she attempted was more of a grimace. She threw her purse and sweater on the table and walked straight to the kitchen, opened the pantry door, and pulled out the bottle. She shook out four caplets into her hand and popped them into her mouth, grabbed a glass, filled it up from the tap, she swallowed hard, and down they went. Mom, I'm leaving. Susie is dressed and eating breakfast. He nodded towards his little sister sitting at the dining room table. Anne is dressed, fed, and in the bathroom brushing her hair. He looked at his mom, waiting for permission. All right, go, but drive carefully. She raised her voice as Randy slammed the door and ran to the Honda. She had seen the concern on his young face and relief when she told him to go. He really was a good boy. He had changed so much over the last six months. He was taken on a lot of the responsibilities around the house, and it made things so much easier that Emily felt guilty. She couldn't do this without him. When he told her he wasn't trying out for football this year, she didn't fuss much, but they did fight when he told her he wasn't signing up for dual enrollment classes at the college. She still nagged him about it, but not a lot. His simple explanation was that he wanted to enjoy his senior year. She told him she understood but knew it was just an excuse to take on more responsibilities at home, and she let it go. Everything had changed, and there was no going back this time. Susie stood up from the table and ran her bowl to the kitchen and dropped it into the sink. She hadn't said a word to Emily or even looked at her, but she was obviously unhappy. Her cheeks were red and splotchy from crying. Emily wanted to comfort her daughter, but she couldn't. She didn't know how. Susie's hair was still in a braid, so Emily walked over to her and started letting out the braid. Let's go get a brush so I can brush out your hair. They walked to the bathroom together. Anne, her youngest, was standing in the bathroom and looked up at her and grinned at her mother. Anne had toothpaste smeared on her chin and Anne was brushing her hair. But Emily could see that Anne still had a clump of hair snarled on the back of her head. Anne and Susie were like night and day. Anne had a huge grin on her face. Her blue eyes sparkled. Emily wished she could still be so young and carefree. Daddy told me to brush my teeth and brush my hair. My teeth are all clean. See, Mommy? She gave her mother a very toothy grin, showing all her gleaming white teeth. That's nice, honey, she said, her head pounding. Let's finish your hair. Emily finished brushing Anne's hair and washed her face. So you talked to your daddy this morning, she said, wiping the toothpaste off her chin. Yep, he came home to say good morning and to get Susie out of bed. 
She didn't want to get up this morning, but I told Dad she was having bad dreams again, and he took care of it. Emily finished up with Anne and sent her to her room to get her book bag. Emily pulled Susie into the bathroom and started brushing out her hair. Susie looked at her mother through the mirror, and Emily could still see a little red around her eyes, but the blotchy patches of red that had covered her cheeks had pretty much disappeared. Have you been having bad dreams again? Susie shook her head up and down. Was it the same dream? Again, she shook her head up and down. Emily could see Susie's cheeks reddening again and saw a tear slide down her cheek and drop off her chin and onto her shirt. Emily grabbed the washcloth and handed it to Susie and she wiped her tears away. Honey, I know this is hard on you. It's been hard on all of us, but we will get through this. You know your father loves you with all his heart. I know that, Mama, but I can't help it. I just miss him, and I want him to come back home, her eyes pleaded. Baby, I'm sorry. I wish I could change things back to the way they were, but I can't. Your daddy and I just can't get along anymore. You should know that by now. Her voice was tight, and she knew she was close to breaking, but she cannot do it in front of Susie. I know, Mom. I'm not a baby anymore, but it's not fair. I miss my daddy. Emily did not know what to say to her daughter to make her feel better. Her head still pounded. All she wanted to do right now was to go to bed and sleep. Emily brushed Susie's hair into her hand for a ponytail and wound the hairband in her hair. They were silent for a moment. Emily wanted to comfort her daughter, but she was just as heartbroken. She was bone-weary and tired beyond words. Mama, why don't you go to bed? You look so tired. It was like Susie was reading her mind. I'm okay, honey. Don't worry about me. I want you to feel better. I hate to see you looking so sad, Emily looked at her daughter. It'll be fine, Mama. Daddy said he would come to school today and have lunch with me if he could. She smiled at her mother reassuringly. I'll help Annie get her shoes on and we will go to the bus stop by ourselves. You know we are not babies anymore. We will be fine. Susie looked and sounded so grown up all of a sudden. Her eyes were still red, but looking back at her mother very seriously. Her voice took on a slight commanding tone. Susie was not a baby anymore. She was nine years old and almost a tween. Emily herself had taken care of her own sisters and brothers at that age, along with all the chores that she was expected to keep up with. Her mother was often a single parent, worked full time, and had expected a lot from Emily. Emily tried very hard to make sure her children did not grow up the same way, but she felt like the nightmare of her childhood was coming true. Yes, I need to go to bed, Emily paused, but it can wait until after you go to school. However, I will take you up on the offer to help Anne get her shoes on, and you need to finish getting ready. I will lay here on the couch until it's time to go. I love you. I love you too, Mom, Susie said. Anne and Susie disappeared into the bedroom they shared. It was only a brief moment when Susie was waking her up. It's time to go, Mom, she shook Emily's arm. Okay, okay, I'm up. Emily swung her legs to the floor and sat up. Her headache was still there, but it was more of a dull roar. She slid her shoes on and walked her daughters the half block to the bus stop. I'll see you both this afternoon, she called to them as they got on the bus. Good night, Mom, they both cried at the same time. The bus driver looked at the girls quizzically, then at Emily, then shut the door of the bus. Emily walked back to the house, made a beeline for her bedroom. She threw on an old t-shirt and crawled into bed. She lay there and listened to the sounds of the morning, dogs barking and the distant traffic, and knew she could not sleep. Emily needed a little extra help this morning. She got out of bed and walked into the kitchen and pulled out the bottle. She kept the whiskey hidden under the sink. She looked at the bottle for a few seconds, then unscrewed the top and took a long swig from the bottle. It went down smooth and warm. Emily liked good whiskey. She pulled a small glass from the cabinet and poured herself another shot. Two shots would have to be enough. This was becoming a bad habit but it helped her relax enough to sleep and she needed her sleep. She put the lid back on the bottle and put it back under the cabinet. Emily walked into the living room and went back to the front window and looked out onto the street. She gasped 
and quickly stepped back away from the window, her heart pounding, her temples throbbing again. There was a patrol car across the street by the park. She eased back up to the window and tried to get a better look, but the vehicle drove down the street at a high rate of speed. It hit the corner, the patrol lights came on, and she heard sirens after she could no longer see the vehicle. She went back to the sink and pulled the whiskey bottle back out and took a long swig off the bottle. And this time she carried the bottle with her and went into her room. She took another long swig and lay down, leaving the bottle on her nightstand. She crawled into her huge empty bed. She wrapped her arms around the pillow and buried her face into it. She screamed into it until she had to breathe, then cried, great braying wails of agony and sadness. She cried because her head hurt, for fear of what the future held, but mostly she cried because her heart was utterly broken. She cried until she was totally drained and finally drifted off to sleep. Mm -hmm.